on this episode of the Dr. Tina show. I'm doing an episode for the dudes. Yes, this is for the men in the audience listening or for the husbands or partners of the women who follow me. Please make your dudes sit down and listen to this episode. I will keep it short and I will not lament on. I'm going to share with you exactly the conversations I had with my male patients on the regular inside my practice. And I'm going to tell you why you want to listen to me. So let's jump in. Number one, I did regenerative injection therapies for well over a decade. I am a chiropractor and a naturopathic physician. And while that may not mean much to a lot of people, I did holistic health and I had license to prescribe in Oregon. And I took over my mentor's practice who was a male who did regenerative injections for decades and who treated a lot of men. That means there was a lot of testosterone going through that clinic. And I was very well-versed in prescribing testosterone. So exogenous testosterone is testosterone from the outside, meaning it's something we deliver to you in a cream or injection or, you know, some other format. Endogenous testosterone is from the inside. It's what you make yourself. So I'm just going to give you a quick rundown on how this all works and how you can protect yourself as you age from what is more uncommonly called andropause. Andropause is just like menopause. It hits men of various ages, but usually in the middle age mark, and it is a precipitous drop in testosterone. I'm going to tell you today that that is mostly due to lifestyle more than it is due to age. Women have their ovaries shut off basically, but men don't have their testes shut off. Men tank their testosterone out with their lifestyle. Now I've seen andropause in very young men. I've seen it in men in their thirties that were stressed out of their mind because they had a new baby and they weren't sleeping and they were, you know, crushing it in their jobs and their careers and, and so on and so forth. I've seen it in guys in their twenties who were overtraining consistently in their sport, but more often than not, we see it around the same time we see menopause, which is that kind of that middle age zone. So just like I said last week on my menopause episode for women, I talked about really understanding that over the age of 40, anything goes when it comes to hormones. So we're not going to stick to a particular age group here, but I'm going to share with you basically kind of the rundown I gave my male patients. And this is important because what I, I will tell you what I told them. If your testosterone is low, your risk for type two diabetes and insulin resistance goes way up. And the way that I learned it from my mentor and from others in my field was if you have low testosterone, you might as well have one foot in the grave. It leads to a lot of symptoms that you don't want, but here's the funny part. The symptoms you don't want are contributing to the low testosterone. So just like in women with our hormones, men are more simple. (laughs) I'll give you that. It's more simple for men, but there's this chicken and egg situation that occurs. And it really sucks for most men because they start to get a little bit older. They start to gain a little bit of belly fat. They start to exercise less. They start to lift less weights because they're usually now they're dealing with family stuff. And like I said, career, family, all of those things. And they really let their physicality and their health slide. And as that happens, insulin resistance sets in. And as insulin resistance sets in, it drives the low T and the low T drives the insulin resistance. And now we have a real problem. So you can see why we are in such a pickle in this country. And it, the good news is it's really easy to get out of this, even without testosterone replacement therapy. In fact, I'll do everything in my power for a patient to get their T up to the highest levels they can naturally without any hormone replacement. So that's that's where we'll start. I want to mention a few things here. So I don't want to make this too complicated, but I want to make sure I give you a good hormonal lesson. So my background, like I said, is I did regenerative injection therapies for a living. That's, you've heard me say that on other episodes, meaning I used people's own body to heal their joints. I would either use prolotherapy, which is a dextro solution and is 100% contingent on the person's ability to heal well themselves, or I would pull their blood and basically concentrate down their platelets and re-inject their platelets. And their PRP or platelet rich plasma was only as good as their overall health status of health. I also could do stem cells so I could extract their fat and I could process that down and I could inject that back into them as more of a fat graft that was rich in stem cells and that would heal joints as well. But again, that was only as good as their fat was and their blood. We would often use PRP with that. 
all of that to say, if you can't heal well, you're not a candidate for these injections. Well, if you don't have testosterone on board, you can't heal well. And so guys would end up in my practice often thinking they had some kind of orthopedic condition, which of course they did, but really it was stemming from the fact that they weren't healing because their testosterone was low. And so I would have to get them on testosterone so I could get them into a anabolic state, which is a pro growth state because stress and cortisol is catabolic. It chews up your tissues. And that's where a lot of people are living. And a lot of it, we can't help anymore because of the current situation that we're in. As this constant unknown is very stressful to the brain and the body, but I needed them in an anabolic state so they would heal. And so often I would say, Hey, you've got a couple of these other low testosterone symptoms going for you. And I'll go through those in just a moment. And you need to get this joint working. So we actually need to get your testosterone levels up so that when I do pull your blood or your stem cells, your fat, your fat graph, that we will have an anabolic state. We really want that blood rich in pro healing hormones and nutrients and molecules, right? So I would encourage them to get their vitamin D up and I would encourage them to get their testosterone up and I would encourage them to get their thyroid working adequately. And then we would do some of these more expensive injections. All right. So that is where this lies. I know a lot about bioidentical hormone replacement, but I wasn't doing it in a, in so much of a general format. I was for a lot of women for a long time, but I cut that off after a while. Cause it's no fun. It's like trying to hit a moving target, but men are so much easier and generally quite compliant, which is pretty damn important. I'm going to go through that in a moment, what I consider compliant, because if you're not compliant, this can all go sideways real fast. So I have treated and prescribed a lot of testosterone in my career, and I've had great success with it. And I've also seen where it goes sideways and I'll share with you how that works. So we've just covered why we need testosterone for healing. Another big impact that low T has on men is mood and affect. And this presents itself in a myriad of ways, but what often happens, especially if they're packing around a gut or a belly that fat there in particular secretes an enzyme called aromatase and aromatase directly turns your testosterone into estrogen. So a lot of these guys actually are making plenty of testosterone, but they're binding it all up with sex hormone binding globulin because their diet is high in alcohol and ultra refined carbohydrates and junk food. And what testosterone they do have free and available for use by the cells is being converted into estrogen. And so they get aggressive and bitchy and I don't have a better way to put it. I wish I did. I don't mean any disrespect by using those terms, but they get aggressive and they get bitchy on top of it. And it's this like, meh, meh about everything, but their affect is low and their mood is low. And this is, I'm sure a miserable place for them to be, but it is equally, if not more miserable for their spouse, because their partner's like, what is wrong with you? This is wild. Usually what comes with it is some malaise, some kind of fatigue, they're tired, they're flat. As the insulin resistance continues to increase, it shrinks the brain. And so they start to lose desire for everything. They're disinterested maybe in sex, but they're all, more likely they sort of lose their purpose and their direction. And ladies, you know what I'm talking about here. I know you do because you message me about it all the time. And men, if this is you, your testosterone is very likely low, but you're not going to be able to fix it at all, even with prescription testosterone, unless you follow and modify a lot of your lifestyle behaviors. So this is where everyone needs to listen up. So that's the thing with testosterone and belly fat. And one of the first things I tell guys when they have low T is you have to lose your belly fat. Now it's challenging to lose body fat when you have low T. It's again, a chicken and egg phenomenon. But if we start cranking you with T, which is what most MDs do, most medical doctors who will prescribe T will just crank you up on high doses of T, but then you're aromatizing it into estrogen. And we do need a little bit of estrogen for sure. We need a little bit on board, but we don't need a lot. And so 
from a natural standpoint, from a holistic standpoint, let's optimize the terrain and then we can apply hormone. That's preferable, right? So if you're doing everything you need to do lifestyle wise, and then we add hormone, it'll work. Same thing with you women. Go back and listen to my episode last week. Same deal. If we're throwing hormones at something and your lifestyle isn't dialed in, it's going to turn, you're going to bonk, you're going to hit a wall and it's going to get disastrous. And in fact, in both genders, when you look at the long-term data on hormone replacement therapy, actually, I just read something the other day. I can't quote it because I, I forgot where I pulled it up, but it said flat out, they debunked that whole testosterone replacement is dangerous. It's that's garbage. You guys that came out several years ago to scare everybody. And so did the one about estrogen and progestins. And I covered the female study in the other episode quick story is basically they were using est synthetic estrogen, which is bioidentical actually, and then synthetic progestins, which are not progesterone. And when progestins bind the receptor in women, it doesn't mimic progesterone. It sits on it and it causes all kinds of problems. So that's where those studies were coming from in men. Testosterone replacement therapy is not dangerous. What's dangerous is when you start to aromatize it in high levels into estrogen. And now you've got elevated levels of estrogen. That's where the stroke, cardiovascular disease risk comes in. And those studies were done on men. They didn't look at any other lifestyle factors. I mean, these guys could have all had pot bellies and been smokers and been eating processed meats and garbage and, you know, not a good study. So I am not at all concerned about prescribing testosterone to men or women. I'm going to do a whole separate episode on why I think women need testosterone as well. But long story short, men, I highly encourage you to seek out somebody who will prescribe testosterone to you, but you've got to follow these lifestyle recommendations I'm about to give you. Quick note about beer. Beer is, so alcohol in general is going to destroy your testosterone straight up. So that's number one. Like if you're worried about low T, get off the booze, period. Just get off the booze. Your testosterone levels will probably double or triple just from getting off the booze. I promise you. Booze is driving that aromatase pathway. It is a mess. It's glomming up your liver. It's not a good idea, but beer in particular, the funny thing about beer is, has always cracked me up is most herbs that we use for hormonal tonification, um, help you sort of move down the pathway of hormonal balance. So like for women chase tree extract, when you're premenopausal will help you with your progesterone hops is specifically pro-estrogenic. And from what I understand, it is one of the only, if not the only herb that is specifically pro-estrogenic. So you intake hops and you make estrogen. This is why we tell breastfeeding mothers to have a small glass of beer if they're having trouble with their milk coming in. It's a tried and true naturopathic remedy. Not only does it calm them, but it immediately starts milk production going for most women because hops is pro-estrogenic. So I find it Ever since I learned that many moons ago, decades ago, I have always found it very humorous that beer is like the man's drink. So if you like IPAs and lighter beer, you might as well be drinking an estrogen tincture. Straight up IPA is an estrogen tincture. I firmly believe that's what's wrong with all of Portland. IPA is like the beer of Portland. And so is PBR, which is just garbage, Paps Blue Ribbon. These guys are drinking estrogen tinctures and they look like it. All right, there's your beer. That's it. I, I, you can get mad at me all you want. Don't shoot the messenger. That's legit. <laughs> Go look it up. It's fine if you get mad at me through any of this. I really don't care. Uh, I'm trying to help. I really want to help you guys. I get a lot of messages from my female followers and they are distressed. Their men are not doing well. Our men are not doing well. If our men were doing well, we wouldn't be in this, this situation. We wouldn't be in this mess. It was the mama bears that stepped up. I really, very few men stepped up to fight during this. I saw mostly, and for you men who did, I applaud you, but I mainly saw women take on this fight on social media. Think about that. Because when you take the warriors out of society, they can't help. And if any of you are warrior gym rats like I am, and you can't go to the gym, you get a little crazy. And what do people do when they're locked inside going a little crazy? They drink, right? They drink alcohol. So alcohol, like I said, is going to destroy your testosterone. Guess what else destroys your testosterone? Marijuana. So THC directly impacts your testosterone levels in a negative way. So guys doing a lot of cannabis thinking it's benign because they're not drinking alcohol. I beg to differ. You are also destroying your testosterone. And I know no one wants to hear this, but th these are the facts. 
Alrighty. So the first signs and symptoms that I would notice in men when they would come in was when they were in my office, <laughs> meaning they had, I only really treated musculoskeletal injuries. So if they weren't healing, something was up. And so that to me was the first sign that we needed to look deeper. And then normally I would go to do a physical exam on them. And usually it was shoulders, low back, but mainly it was knees. And so I would go to pull their pant leg up to do a physical exam on their knee. And nine times out of 10, they had missing hair on their shins. Now, this is something you're not going to hear anywhere else. This is not anything I was ever taught. It was just clinical correlation that I saw over and over and over again. And I started to correlate it with low T and I was always right. So I would see hairless shins and it was bilateral, meaning both sides. And they'd start to bald on their shins. And I would say, oh, and I'd start asking low testosterone questions and lo and behold, they would answer yes to a lot of them. We would run labs and they would just, sure enough, they had low T. So that's a big one. Signs are what I see and symptoms are what they experience. So we're trained to look for signs and symptoms. This is why I can see low T from a mile away. I can just look at someone. I'm like, oh, low T. And I'm telling you, most dudes in Oregon have low T. I was just in Texas, lots of good testosterone there. I think it's probably because of the sun straight up, like dudes who live in the sun have great testosterone. And I know this because I'm looking for it, right? I'm visually observant of this, but also I was dating through my forties and that's about the age when things really go sideways for a lot of guys. And sadly, I have to say most of the dudes, my daughter's age are looking very effeminate. Like they're, um, I don't say that disrespectfully. They're just very, you can see the low testosterone in these young, young men it's troubling to me because I can see it in their appearance and I can see it in their affect. And so that's telling me that that whole generation has been impacted negatively. And we could talk at length why, but the bottom line is sperm counts are expected to be at zero by the 2040s. So we don't have that much longer until humans are not even going to be fertile up according to the data. I don't know. But I know that I'm seeing a lot of dudes in my age group not looking so healthy on the testosterone scale, but you can tell they once had it. You can tell because of physical features, right? Muscularity, jaw, the jaw is a big giveaway. When I start to see men's jaws lessen and atrophy, the musculature atrophy around the jaw, I know testosterone's dipping. But these young men in my daughter's age group in their early 20s and even the teenagers, I'm seeing just a it's, it is troublesome. And I get that teenage boys are not really, their testosterone doesn't tend to turn on until, you know, 17 or 18, maybe later in their twenties, you know, men's necks will thicken up and they'll start to broaden their shoulders. And that's just how that works, but we're not really seeing that happen anymore. And it's troublesome. So I say that with no disrespect at all. This is just observational data that I'm seeing, but it does concern me when I see a man in his twenties and in his thirties, and he still hasn't had that development of masculinity of that. When the testosterone kicks in, that comes from lifestyle, strength training, getting out in the sun, all kinds of things I'm about to bring up here. All right. So not healing well, big one, not having gains in the gym. So decreased strength, decreased gains, starting to hurt themselves more often. When I start to see a lot of injuries in folks in my age group, that's a sure sign that hormones are off women too. And that might be estrogen and progesterone for women, but definitely some testosterone, tired, lethargic, apathetic, uh, balding is actually one they'll start, their hairline will start to go off the front or back here. And that tells me that something's up with their testosterone. It's just going down the wrong pathway. And that pathway can be genetically driven, but more often it's lifestyle driven on top of the genes. And we've talked in the past on the show about how, you know, genetics loads the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. So if they're making a lot of DHT, they're going to start to bald. And that's usually stress and poor lifestyle. I cannot tell you how many guys I have helped turn around their hairline. And we may not get it back, but we can arrest the loss. We can get it to stop. It's usually stress and poor lifestyle habits. It's usually alcohol and stress <laughs> and poor food choices like seed oils, ultra refined carbohydrates, all of that. And they start to get a little belly. They may actually get some breast tissue. Uh, they'll start to get fat on the posterior armpits. They'll start to get love handles that no matter what age you are, that is a sign that your estrogen is elevated and your T is either going down that pathway or it's starting to drop. So again, testosterone can be adequate and healthy at healthy levels being pumped out of the gonads, 
but it's either being bound up by sex hormone binding globulin, which is a protein that binds it. If you're super, super low carb, or you're actually high carb, mostly high carb, but even super, super low carb people will have an elevation in sex hormone binding globulin. And that sucks because it binds up your free T. So we want free T, not bound T. So when your doctor tests total testosterone, they're testing bound and free in the blood. And that sucks because your total may be adequate, but your free is lousy because it's all bound up. So they need to look at free testosterone, total testosterone, and then sex hormone binding globulin levels. And they also need to look at estrogens because if you're converting into estrogen, you might have plenty of testosterone, but it's going down that pathway. So it can go a lot of different ways. And usually it's some combination of all of the above. What else will they get? Um, like I said, belly fat is a big one, not just that pot belly, but like I said, that fat distribution in other places, the leg hair on the shins, they might actually be losing hair elsewhere on their body. And why they ended up in my office was always because they had an injury that just didn't want to heal. And then the last on this list, one of the very last symptoms to show up is erectile dysfunction. And so guys on my table, I'm doing a physical exam on his knees, looking at his shin hair. And I say, Hey, your shin hair is balding on both sides. Do you have any symptoms of low testosterone? And I just, cause I'm just trying to open the conversation. I'm a woman. Guys don't want to talk to chicks about this, you know? So I'm trying to just be, I'm just trying to open the conversation and see if they're open to even discussing it. That's how we have to work in this. We're not supposed to bring up sensitive subjects without actually asking if we can bring up the sensitive subject. And I think that's fine. So I ask and nine times out of 10, they'd say, oh, I'm, I'm fine down there. If you know what I mean. And I'm like, well, no, that's not actually what I was asking, but thanks for the information. You know, they're swearing that they don't have any form of erectile dysfunction and that's great, but that's, I've noticed one of the last symptoms. Usually I see apathy, fatigue, depression, although they won't call it depression. They just sort of lose their lust for life. They get crabby and they, um, they, their cognition might start to go. So they're not as sharp and all the other symptoms that we've already talked about. So last on the list, but seems to be the first one every dude associates with it is erectile dysfunction. I will tell you though, all of this is being exacerbated by insulin resistance and insulin resistance, a 2018, 2021 study looking at 2018 data showed that 94% of us adults have busted metabolic health, meaning they have some level of insulin resistance. And you can go back and listen to other episodes where I dive deeper into that, but that's basically where you're in a pre-diabetic state. And that state will last, you know, 10 plus years before you ever even get diagnosed with Frank type two diabetes, but all the same bad things are happening during that period, including the cardiovascular system impact. And it's pronounced. And so if you have erectile dysfunction, that is a sure sign that you are dealing with some level of insulin resistance. Now the cause of it might be sleep apnea, but that's rare. Usually it's due to your lifestyle habits. It's due to some of the things I'm going to list on how to improve your low testosterone naturally before you ever go get a prescription. Main culprits here, alcohol, like I mentioned, lack of muscle mass. So guys are not strength training, lack of healthy sleep. Guys are not going to sleep. They're staying up all night, staring at blue light, playing video games. I'm not even going to get into the discussion of porn but that's a whole other thing, <laughs> but they're just not sleeping. Well, they're not having intimacy on a regular basis. So they're not having sex and not having sex will lead to problems in of itself. And like I said, insulin resistance and metabolic dysfunction. So what is a guy to do? I made a post yesterday on Instagram and people lost their minds on me. And they're like, you can't tell if somebody has low testosterone just by looking at them. And I'm like, Actually, yes, I totally can. One of the first signs I see is everything I've just described, but also I start to see loss of muscle mass. So this is another reason yet again, why I say strength training is non-negotiable. I think I've done a, you know, I beat this horse to death for women on why they need to strength train, but men, I mean, this is just a no brainer, right? So what are the best steps to take? I'm going to give you 10 of them. And I'm going to keep it really simple. And this is what I told all my patients. Number one, you got to lift weights two to three times a week minimum. And you have to focus on the lower body, the big muscle groups of the legs, the glutes, the thighs. That's where your focus is. What do most dudes do in the gym? 
they skip leg day and they pump up their upper bodies. Now, granted, we have studies from all over the world showing that a woman's preference in a man's body is really that tapered V shape. So the larger shoulders, the wider shoulders, and the smaller waist is hands down across the globe, the preferential body type for women. That's what they want to see in a man. That's what is sexually arousing. That is what shows us that we are in the company of a protector. That is a man's role in every mammalian species on the planet. I don't know why we fight this as humans and we think, oh, we're above that. Men are protectors. So we need our men to be strong. So lift weights and focus on the lower body and quit skipping leg day. Yes, it's nice to have the big broad shoulders. And yes, for the reasons I just described, that's very appealing. But if you don't have the leg muscles and the glutes going for you, you're really not going to get the most bang for your buck when it comes to insulin resistance and fending that off. Okay. So don't skip leg day. Number two, lose your gut. You can do this through really dialing in your diet and walking, going for lots of walks, walks accomplish, not just walk. It's not just the walking. It's really a great stress reliever. You can practice box breathing while you're walking. You'll have lots of clarity of thought while you're walking, but walks are hands down. One of the best things you can do. I see more women taking up walking for weight loss than I do men, but man, this is the secret weapon. And we have to lose the gut because the gut is what's driving the aromatase into the estrogen. So if, if you continue to keep the body fat, especially the gut on you, and you're doing all the things to increase your testosterone naturally or free it up naturally, it's still going to drive down that pathway. If you keep rocking the belly. So I say this with love again, we got to get rid of the belly fat. Number three, insulin resistance. Like I said, erectile dysfunction is a sure sign that something is wrong with your plumbing and your vascularity. If it's happening in your nether regions, it's happening in your heart, it's happening in your brain. Your whole cardiovascular system is impacted. This is a blood flow issue. So we don't want erectile dysfunction. And if we see it, we need to get concerned and fast. And now I've seen this, I cannot tell you how many times I've had marathon runners, long distance cyclists, all of these different sports that guys do. And they tell me they're struggling with erectile dysfunction. Well, there is data multiple from multiple sources showing that this chronic cardio, this endurance type training significantly dumps your testosterone levels out. So if you're a cyclist on top of it, now you've actually got mechanical disruption to the testes. So I'm not a huge fan of cycling for guys. And I can promise you as you age, it will dump out your testosterone. If you're a long distance runner, if you're running a ton of miles, especially as you get older, you will see a drop in your testosterone. I've also seen a ton of insulin resistance in that group. And I, it's not just because the foods they're eating. It's not just because they like to drink wine, <laughs> which is a big one. I live out in Willamette Valley in wine country. And guys like to go on these really long bike rides from Portland and then drink all day at the wineries and then ride back. And I'm like, have fun with your testosterone plummeting, but not to mention that's not very safe, but I digress. I think the reason I saw a lot of insulin resistance and prediabetes and diabetes in these folks was because the act of chronic cardio is really oxidative and that oxidative stress will take its toll on your vascular system and on your hormonal system. So, um, strength training over chronic cardio. Okay. Number four, use it or lose it. You will have better testosterone levels if you're having regular intercourse period. So if you don't have a partner to do it with, use it, do whatever you got to do. This is literally a use of plumbing women, same rules apply. To be honest with you, if we're talking genitals, use it or lose it. We need blood flow there. We need action. We need it to get used so that those tissues know how to respond and do so in a healthy, predictable way. Now, can you overdo it? Yes, you absolutely can overdo it. And I think if you I was going to get to this at the end, but I'll just throw it in here. Now, zinc is really important for men. We lose a lot of zinc in our semen and well, men do, <laughs> I don't, but women lose it over stress. 
So a woman who's zinc deficient will show up as someone a classic is like disordered eating, low appetite, lots of anxiety. You know, your skinny little anorexic teenage girls that don't want to eat. Those girls probably need zinc terribly. The best sources of zinc hands down is comes from ruminant animals, beef being my favorite. It's a very bioavailable form of zinc. It's wonderful. And it's really the only thing, I mean, you can pound zinc all day and I will not see zinc levels go up. But when people start pounding ground beef and steak, I do see zinc levels balancing out. You can tell by if you have my fingernails are dirty from being out in the outside today playing with my dog, but um, white spots on your fingernails, that'll tell you. But for men, they lose it in their semen. And the more ejaculate that they have, the more semen loss, the more zinc they're going to lose. And so zinc's really, really important that you keep that adequate in your diet. And it helps with that aromatase step. It helps shut that down. So it really helps keep your testosterone as testosterone and not turning so much into estrogen. It's an aromatase inhibitor, a natural aromatase inhibitor. So big fan of zinc thing about zinc. I'll just say this. Do not start pounding it. Talk to your healthcare professional who knows how to use it because too much zinc will inhibit your immune system. There's a sweet spot with zinc. We don't want to take too much of it. So I'm a big fan of oysters. I'm a big fan of beef. I'm a big fan of food sources, not a big fan of pounding a supplement, but we oftentimes do need to have a supplement in there. And again, I'm not your doctor. This is not medical advice. Talk to your healthcare professional because I have personally bottomed out my immune system through too much zinc. And it led to me getting every single cold and flu that went around. So I will just give you that disclaimer. Number five, I don't have a better way to say this and I don't have conclusive data on this, but I have seen this time and time again with patients, friends, the community I'm a part of, which is, you know, really being involved with folks who like to strength train. And the bottom line is people with messed up hormones give off pheromones, which will impact your hormones. So if you're hanging out with a bunch of weak men with low T, your T will be lowered. If you're hanging out with a bunch of warriors, your T will go up. And I lived this. I went to the naturopathic college the same time I went to the chiropractic college. The chiropractic college was all dudes. The naturopathic school was predominantly all women. And it was like an es passive aggressive estrogen cesspool over there at the naturopathic school. And I watched the men who did go there. I watched their testosterone levels just precipitously drop. I could see it on them because they were around all this estrogen. So I know it was impacting them. And a couple of them were like, you know, not super manly men anyway. I mean, they just weren't like raw guys, you know, like big but there were some that were like super masculine dudes and I could see it really taking a toll on them. And I would always tell them once you get out of here, I promise you in six to nine months, once you go back to strength training regularly and just get away from this estrogen cesspool that the school is, it's a socialist institution over there. It's not, I wouldn't hi highly discourage anybody from going to any of the West coast naturopathic schools. They've all just joined forces. Anyway, they would always message me like a year later and say, God, you know, you're right. The second I got back with my buddies on the East coast or wherever or in the Midwest and started training with them again, man, I feel so much better. And it wasn't just the training. It was that they were like with their warrior dudes. And I've had patients that were just a little bit on the cusp of low T and they were young enough that I'm like, I don't really feel like hopping you up on testosterone exogenously. What do you like to do? And more often than not, they were like, I like jujitsu. I like boxing. I like strength training. I like CrossFit. I'm like, good, go do that. And it's not just the act of doing it. It's like the phys being in the physicality in the space of other men with good testosterone levels, healthy testosterone levels increased their testosterone. And I don't know how else to say it. So if you're surrounded, especially in the workplace, if you're working, it's rampant up here in the dot-com industry. It's just a bunch of like low T guys, passive aggressive, it's not a great environment for somebody who is trying to optimize their T. So choose wisely who you spend your time with. And again, that's going to make some people so mad. I'm sure. I thought that would be the one thing that made people the most mad about my post yesterday on Instagram, but they were far more upset about the meme I put up there. I put it in the form of a meme, but everybody kind of missed the point. So avoid weak men and train with the warriors. I, tried and true advice. I promise you, um, avoid junk food, duh, but really I see so much erectile dysfunction and low T and guys that just kind of live off fast food and soda, just erase that from your diet 
and cut the booze out. And I promise you, your testosterone levels will come up and you will feel so much better. Also avoid grazing all day. Grazing all day definitely keeps you in this constant insulin surge state and you low grade desensitize your cells to insulin, which makes you functionally insulin resistant. So this whole grazing nonsense, I'm not a fan of, I'm a big fan of intermittent fasting. So you eat one to two, probably two big meals a day and like call it good the rest of the time and learn how to go without it. Right. Booze is not your friend. I already beat that one to death. Sleep like it's your job. This is huge. And I know I was talking about the blue light and the late nights and all of that, but just the act of not sleeping for just a few nights in a row can actually put you in an insulin resistant state. So not sleeping is like the kiss of death for your testosterone. As my husband always does, like daily sex, sleep like it's your job. That's how he rolls. It, it really works for him. Tanning, getting tan, sunlight helps your testosterone in so many ways. It's the infrared, it's the vitamin D, it's all the things, but I'm telling you, Yes, we can use red light panels. I absolutely love them. I love BioLite. I'll make sure to put the link for a discount to BioLite in the show notes. I think everybody should have some kind of red light. But, and I'm telling you, expose your genitals straight up to the red light. But getting tan all over your body, I don't know if you guys have ever noticed this. I sure do. I get far more muscular in the summer when I'm tan. I look better. A layer of puff comes off me. I get stronger. That's my testosterone optimizing because of my suntan. And we see this in men. And again, I was telling you about dudes in Texas versus dudes in Oregon, Portland in particular, guys that live in the sun just have better muscularity, which means their testosterone levels are better. So if you live somewhere sunny, go outside, get yourself some nice skin exposure, go back and listen to my safe sunning episodes. I'll make sure to have that linked in the pod notes as well, so that you can hear all about how to do it safely. We're not trying to do skin cancer, but getting a suntan is your friend. I promise you, if that's all you do and cut out junk food and booze, you're going to be winning. And then number 10 is your partner's level of health, which is again, a very touchy subject, but your partner's level of health is having a direct impact on your health, period. Our microbiomes are contagious. We have adequate data showing that these chronic lifestyle degenerative diseases like high blood pressure, which is really insulin resistance, even down to some gut issues that are supposedly genetic, like inflammatory bowel disease, they're contagious. Obesity has been shown to, to be contagious in more of a social contagion, but also in a microbiome contagion. So I'm not throwing anyone under the bus, but I can't tell you how many people I treated, especially we're talking about men here. So we'll stick to that conversation and I would meet their spouses in the lobby and I could tell almost immediately why their tea was low. And women, I'm not throwing you under the bus. I just am telling you what I saw. And this does have something to do with the relationship, I'm sure. And the roles people are playing in those relationships and who's in charge and who's making the money and who's griping at who. And, you know, it goes both ways. All that aside, your microbiome is indeed contagious. And there is a social contagion to a lot of these conditions. So I highly encourage you to evaluate if you're and women, I'll just throw this in here because we were talking about semen. If your dude's on a lot of prescription medications, those medications are going through into his semen and going into you. And they may go through just exactly as they went in his mouth, or they may go through a few passes in the liver and turn into different metabolites. And sometimes they turn into intermediate metabolites, which are even more toxic than the original drug. And so often I would be treating women who are my age for hormonal imbalances, come to find out husbands on five different medications. And she's probably just dealing with the side effects of all that. We know it's in the water at high levels. So it's definitely coming through in the semen. So I say all this with love. This is just observational stuff I want to put out there because it's stuff no one talks about. And I don't think a lot of people are thinking about. So anyway, your partner's level of health, it impacts you. It goes both ways. If your wife is not feeling good, if she or your female partner, male partner, whatever, if they're not feeling well, and they're not, you know, in, in great health, it behooves you to help them get there because it will improve your health. That's all I'm saying. And that's it. So I wanted to quickly 
share this. I actually am so adamant about lifestyle stuff that when I prescribed men testosterone, I made them sign a contract on compliance. And in that contract, I explained a few things. So I'm going to just quickly go through this and then we'll close. You've been diagnosed with low testosterone. This is a common condition in men. Low testosterone is not always because the testes are not producing enough of the hormone, but for various other lifestyle reasons. The top reasons for low testosterone from a functional medicine perspective, in my opinion, are as follows. One, high intake of ultra-refined carbohydrate sugars, which can lead to blood sugar dysregulation and insulin resistance. Number two, exercise that consists of high amounts of aerobic or cardiovascular exercise and very little to no weight bearing or strength training exercise. Number three, low intake of proper proteins and fat. So you guys have heard my yammering on about food. So I'll just address this guys. You want to be, if, especially if you're strength training, you want to be hitting one gram of animal protein per pound of body weight. So if you're a 200 pound guy, that's about two pounds or more of protein that you want to be ingesting a day. It's probably far more than you're currently doing. So if that's all you did was just significantly increase your protein, your testosterone levels would undoubtedly improve. Many men also have a secondary problem. They are converting their testosterone to estrogen. They quite literally on an enzymatic level are turning their testosterone into estrogen. This only exacerbates the above issues as well as makes you the patient more prone to further health ailments in the future, including heart disease, stroke, prostate cancer, and other inflammatory conditions. How does this conversion from testosterone to estrogen happen? By an enzyme called aromatase that is secreted by fat cells. Fat cells in the abdomen are the greatest culprits here, excess abdominal or visceral fat. Sometimes this process simply happens because the chemical milieu of the patient. By far the worst culprits are obesity, poor dietary choices, and chronic cardio with little weight-bearing exercise. Also lack of sleep. What is the solution? not simply prescribing testosterone. If you are an aromatizer, you will likely turn it into estrogen in a matter of time. The solution is number one, converting to more of a meat-based diet. Number two, you know, getting adequate protein. Number two, lowering aerobic exercise to the levels we will discuss by each individual and incorporating weight-bearing strength training into your routine at least three times a week, 20-minute sessions each minimum. Number three, taking the prescribed supplements that will assist you in optimizing your testosterone levels and lowering your estrogen levels. I used the very much the same ingredients that you guys will find in my libido vitality supplement that is inside my store. I will link that in the show notes. I'm not saying it directly raises testosterone, but it definitely helps those pathways in both men and women. I'm a huge fan of it. It's called libido vitality. It's awesome. It's got some ingredients you might recognize because they seem to be popular on the Instagram, but absolutely. Absolutely love that product for stamina and just for getting guys feeling good and women too. It really helps with the, what the label says, libido, vitality. <laughs> and number four, getting lab work done as often as the doctor deems necessary and in a timely fashion. I say this because your doctor, if they have you on testosterone replacement therapy, they absolutely should be running labs on you every four to six months to make sure you are not going down the bad pathways, making sure your estrogens are not going through the roof or plummeting out if they have you on an aromatase inhibitor and making sure that your T levels are getting up there and they're in the free form, not just the bound total form. I go on to say in this contract, I will work with you on the above lifestyle changes and we can proceed with treatment only if you're willing to take the appropriate changes in your diet and exercise and have lab work completed on schedule. No refills outside of office visits. Why is that important? Because you guys, you can't just take this stuff and bark at your doctors to refill it for you. You have to take responsibility for yourself. And if your doctors are not being this OCD about it, they are missing the boat because this isn't to be, this is a controlled substance. This is on the, you have to have a DEA license to prescribe testosterone. So respect your doctors, respect their lab requests, respect their appointment requests. They're trying to keep you safe and make sure that you are feeling your best and that you're optimizing all the work that they're doing together. And if they're not looking at lifestyle and they're not looking at estrogens and they're not looking at any of that, find a new doctor. So on that, I will close. I appreciate you all. Check out the show notes for a discount on the libido vitality, as well as the links to the other episodes that I mentioned. If you have any questions and would like further information for me to do a podcast in the future, while I cannot give you medical advice and answer your emails, send, shoot an email over to my podcast producer. It's podcast at drtina.com, D-R-T-Y-N-A.com. And we will make sure to consider your questions for an upcoming episode. And lastly, if you would do me the huge favor of subscribing to my podcast on your favorite podcast player, I prefer Apple Podcasts. 
or even my Substack or both, you will get notified when new episodes are released. And it really helps get visibility out there for my show, like review, subscribe, all of that good jazz and share this with a friend or one of, you know, a male in your life that you love. If you found this episode helpful, and we will be back next week.